I'm a big fan of Draymond Green. A lot of people don't like him here in New York, but I love his personality. I love his attitude. He reminds me of Charles Oakley from the 90s uh, New York Knicks, uh, a gritty player that doesn't give a crap what anybody thinks. I listen to his podcast, and I, I've, I've watched this guy grow he, from Michigan State to the NBA, a second-round draft pick. Really has – I feel like he has a lot on his shoulder because he's got a lot to prove. Are you surprised that he's become the player that he has become as a Golden State Warrior? Well, uh, I'll just tell you the story from when he worked out for the Warriors. And every, you know, let's let's face it, you know the the Warriors passed on him in the in the draft too. To be fair to everybody, everybody kind of passed on him. He was a second round pick, so because he you know he wasn't in the shape that he's in now. That was the biggest thing that that I think you know took him to the next level and then he started improving himself and he was smart to begin with but when he worked out for the Warriors they had two or three other guys you know guys that they were thinking about in the second round and so they put him together with some of the young coaches and played a little pickup ball you know three on three and games to 11 whatever just to see how guys work and how they you know help each other and things like that and they kept mixing up the lineups the problem was Whatever team Draymond was on kept winning. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of look around and say, okay, we'll put this guy over here. Huh? Oh, Draymond's team won again. Okay. So, and so they thought, huh, that's a kind of interesting. And and he is such a competitor. And what he doesn't get enough credit, I think, is he's really smart on the floor. And he's smart off the floor, too. Don't get me wrong. And, and it's great to watch him. You know, everybody comes in and they're young and they don't know what they don't know. And now – you know, he's got kids and he's, you know, becoming the family guy and, and that's kind of cool to watch. But uh, on the court, he is so smart. And that part of the equation, you know, when you had in the last few years, when you had Durant, Iguodala, and uh, and Draymond, three guys with incredible high basketball IQs, and then you had Curry, who knows the game. Clay Thompson's going to be out there balling on your best offensive, you know, guard or wing. And so that's why I think one of the reasons the Warriors were so devastating. They were an incredibly smart team as well as being incredibly talented. Andre Iguodala, you brought up, has been a name that's been bumped around because the Grizzlies waved him. Everyone thought he was going to get traded to the Lakers or a lot of other spots. What do you think is the likelihood that somebody like Iguodala returns to the Warriors next year? Well, with Andre, now I said never say never. He keeps getting contract extensions. He's gonna play until he's fifty. Um, he, I told him I wanted to, I wanted to negotiate my next contract. Uh, he's, he's, he's a, again another incredibly smart guy, and I've never seen a player rise to the occasion. You know, the bigger the game, the better Andre gets. The tighter the situation the better Andre gets. And, uh, what, I mean, game winners, uh, 2017, Durant hits the three, Warriors go to the lead. What happens in the next play? Andre guarding LeBron, deflects the ball off LeBron, going out of bounds, and the Warriors get it back, and now Cleveland has to foul, and the game is over. It's over. And uh, he, he he's, again, one of the smartest guys I know. Uh, Andre's going to be... Uh, a wildly successful entrepreneur because he is smart enough to do his own homework. He doesn't just go, Oh, I like this company. Uh, you know, I'll look into that. No, he goes and does his research and meets with people. And, and so he, he's, again, I think he's a guy I wish, you know, I, I wish people could see him play up close over those years because he would make little plays that wouldn't show up in, in you know, a box score, getting a stop making a pass, which you would maybe get a hockey assist on because he knew where the ball was going to go next, which is going to lead to a, an easy bu- easy bucket. Um, just a, a million things that he would do on a nightly basis that, uh, that helped the team win. We are talking to the voice of the Golden State Warriors, Tim Roy. Tim, you were there for all three championships of the Golden State Warriors and the growth of some of these young players like Steph Curry, like Klay Thompson and Draymond Green and even Kevin Durant coming to the team. Out of all those championships, what championship really stood out to you? Well, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's interesting. You know, The Warriors actually now are tied with the Bulls all the time with six championships because they won in 75. They won the first championship when they were the Philadelphia Warriors in 46-47 and then won again in 1956. 
so the Warriors, for most of my career uh, with the Warriors, had been like a, a punchline. We would go into different, you know, arenas, and the newspaper would have the headline, Woeful Warriors Meet Charlotte or Meet New York, you know, or, you know, in Boston. And the, the Warriors would, you know, would always have some young talent going, but they could never get it to the next level and, and never got a situation where they were, you know, going to be a true contender. And then when this came along and it started, uh, you know, under Mark Jackson, you knew they were good. Okay. That was a good team and they were on the way up. And then when Steve Kerr came in and Draymond Green rose up, you know, did his ascension, that changed the whole. And then and the Warriors got deeper too. They were a deeper team, you know, adding Livingston, adding, you know, Barbosa and, and Mo Spates and good little role players. Uh, so the, to me, the first one stands out the most because, you know, up until that time, there were only two Warrior teams from the early 70s to 2013 that Warrior fans were really in love with. And one was the 74-75 championship team that had Rick Barry. And um, the other was the 06-07, we believe, team that won 42 games. But they finished the year 16-5 uh, and five over the last 21, upset Dallas at 8, beating a 1 seed. Doesn't happen that often. Um, and this team now gave a brand new generation of Warrior fans their own team that they could love and, and say, yeah, we won the title in 14-15. And to see those fans uh, and the way they came out and, and just you know blew the roof off the building consistently and the, the parade after the championship through Oakland, uh, that's, that's a memory that uh, I'll cherish for the rest of my lifetime, and I was incredibly lucky to share it with my family. Last question for me, referring to your broadcasting career with the Warriors or even before that, do you have a favorite call or a moment or something that you did in your career, a particular preference? Was it one of the championships? Was it one of those crazy Steph Curry shots? Do you have a particular favorite moment for you? Well, I got a rejection letter from KCOW <laughs> in Alliance, Nebraska. Does that count? Hey, <laughs> Cal, give me a rejection letter. Um, <laughs> No, that was early. That was early in my career. And actually, uh, I know you guys are on Long Island. I actually started my career in Utica, New York. That's where I learned on the job and and did play by play for everything: minor league hockey, minor league basketball, college hockey and basketball, college football. I did. It was one of those you know stations that carried everything. And and uh, and I remember my days. You know, having grown up in Connecticut, uh, I remember my days in upstate New York very fondly, with the exception of you know the blizzard every now and then. Uh, but I guess if there's a moment uh, that I was proud of, um, there were, I'll give you a couple. Obviously, winning the championship, those championship calls, calling the first Warrior championship in 40 years, that has to be number one. There's no way around that. And then two years later, calling the Warriors win on the home floor. No Bay Area team had won on their home you know, barn since the Oakland A's did in the 70s. Uh, and obviously, football is kind of, kind of screwy because it's always a neutral field. Um, but, but the other, the other thing I was quite proud of was in, in the mid 2000s before all this started, I, I got a job doing TV work with the A's for three years and it dawned on me that I had done, you know, I'd done a, a, a preseason NHL game when they had a, a stop in Phoenix and I was working there and I convinced our, our program director, to let me broadcast the game. I did that cause I had done a lot of hockey um, and then, you know, adding the, the major league baseball, it kind of made all the lean years and, and the, the growing years, uh, really worthwhile because, you know, when you, you get to a, a major league level, you realize how hard it is to get there. And then also how blessed you are to get, to get that kind of a job. And so th- those are a couple of moments that, that stand out for me that, that, you know, all the, the dreams I had when I was a little kid, you know, of playing with my baseball cards and football cards and, and Stratomatic up in you know north of Hartford, you know all the dreams of that kid, what he wanted to do, came true professionally, and um, and that's that's rare, you know, to do a job that you know you love and and that you know every you know every day you know, I get up and I'm ready to go to work and, and it never feels like work, and that that's uh, that's a great thing. Tim, have you watched uh, any Netflix since uh, you've been home all this time? Well, you know, uh, when you guys called, I had to hit the pause button. We're uh, plowing <laughs> through uh, Ozark right now. Really? Uh, yeah, it's really it's the, uh, it's really well done. Now it's not to the faint of heart, and I wouldn't <laughs> show it in front of kids, but uh, but 
but it's really, really good. The uh, first doing that. The and, first and, season um, stinks. I uh, hate the first season. Com- I hate the first comedy- season. You hate the first season? I hate the first season of the Ozark. I, it's it's the uh, second season and the third season. It really gets good. It really gets good. Oh, so. Yeah. I'm right uh, early second season right now. Oh, you're going to so love looking it. looking forward to that. It's going to get good. Um, you, the other one, if you like, uh, again, it's a little dark comedy, but and but it's got two tremendous actors in Michael Douglas and Alan Arkin, a thing called the Kaminsky Method. Hmm. Uh, where Michael Douglas is playing this actor who never really made it, but he's parlayed it into teaching young kids how to act. And, but, you know, he's got issues on the home front and, and they both have, you know, uh, he's had failed marriages. Alan Arkin's got a, a, a sick wife, and it, but it's the, the, the timing of the, the comedy is, and the, and the, the, uh, the, the script is just really, really well done. It's really well done. Tim, why don't you tell all the fans how they could find you? Uh, sure. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter at Warriors Vox, Warriors V O X, and and uh, you know we try to uh, Kate, when the season's on, I I will ask uh, our fans or NBA fans for questions to answer on our weekly show. So that's something we do, and and we when we're on the air, we also try to get people to to respond to us on Twitter, tell us where they're listening, how they're listening, and and to try to. Uh, Try to keep them going that way. So that's what that's a place where people can uh, can find me. Tim, if there's an if, if the NBA season comes back, if it does come back, we would love to get you back on. That would be great. That would be my pleasure. Awesome. Thank you, Tim, for joining us. Oh, my, my pleasure. You guys be safe. Stay safe, everyone. You too. Stay to safe. you and your family.